Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. You can you can rattle off a list of names. They were all micro caps, small caps when they began their journeys. And the the key theme to all of them, and this is why I always warn people against just looking back in hindsight, because it's easy, really easy to look back in hindsight. But if you go back and you read some of the old reports from these businesses, they weren't super obvious. You know, even back then they weren't super obvious. They had their issues, they had their warts, they never looked perfect. But, you know, like we said before, management grind away, they execute, they pull the right levers when they have to on strategic shifts, acquisitions, and then over time, good things happen and and compounding takes effect and and you end up with large, beautiful businesses that they're they're the examples of what we want to find as as small and micro cap investors. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. How small is the small end of the Australian share market? Who shows the love for this end of the market? Well, that would be Luke Winchester, MD and CIO of Merriweather Capital. G'day, Luke. G'day, Phil. Thanks for having me back on. Merriweather Capital is a specialist small and micro-cap boutique funds management firm based in Newcastle, New South Wales. The firm focuses on absolute performance, deep fundamental research and understanding of the businesses invested in. And Luke, you're also one of the largest investors in the fund, so interests are fully aligned and you have skin in the game as well. Yeah, skin in the game. Single largest investor in the fund, you mm. know, for my, my family's money. Yeah, and it's also the single you know, largest investment we have. No, no other investments outside of the fund, so fully aligned with my investors. And, and I think that's how it should be, as you said, skin in the game. You, you want managers who, who are putting their money where their mouth is, so that's certainly what I try and do. It was great to catch up with you in person. I think the first time we actually met in person was at um, mm. uh, Coffee Microcaps, at uh, Mark Tobin's Co- Coffee Microcaps in Sydney, which was, I mean, it's just great to go to those events and just see all of the innovation that's happening that just flies under the radar of the usual an- analysis of the Australian share market. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we'll, we'll obviously dig deeper into this topic, but um, you're completely right. You know, when you, when you look at the Aussie market, there's top of my head, 3,000 odd stocks on the market. Um, and, you know, the vast majority of them are small and micro caps, but all the attention from brokers, media, and, and even, I guess, most retail investors is, is focused at the larger end. You know, they're well researched, well covered, and it leaves a, a real a real dearth of information for, for the micro caps. And, you know, guys like Mark and myself and others, you know, we do what we can to, to help these companies get their stories out because they often have really good stories to tell. And a lot of them are just genuinely good little businesses you know, on their path to becoming a lot bigger. And as investors, that's exciting. And that's what we want to be a part of. So this interview, we're basing on a recent appearance on Ausbiz. And um, we're going to focus on a table or a snippet from a spreadsheet that you were looking at in in this episode. Before we do that, I just wanted to also, just by way of warning, it's very exciting into the market. But why should new investors avoid the small end of the market? Well, look, it it is more risky. We are talking about smaller businesses, and, and by definition, they have smaller operations, smaller balance sheets, smaller cash balances. They're more exposed, I suppose, to certainly macroeconomic factors. If we see some sort of cyclical weakness in the Australian economy, which a lot of people are predicting, um, larger businesses are just better positioned to weather those storms and come out the other side. Smaller businesses, you know, especially those that are still reliant on external external capital, you know, from investors or, or from debt markets, they can find themselves in a bit of trouble when when times like that come around. And, you know, that, that will obviously um, colour the conversation we're about to have because you've seen that play out in the micro caps. You've seen that sort of reaction to smaller companies over the last 12 to 18 months as, as that macroeconomic background has deteriorated a little bit. So, yeah, so inherently more risky, but, you know, all things equal, that risk equals reward. That's what we're looking for as investors. And micro caps, we can touch on a few examples later on. You know, the, the rewards available to investors when you can find these companies when they're small, but on that growing path to becoming much larger, you can have companies that uh, make an investing career, um, you know, with, with some of these businesses, if you find them early and then have the stomach to hold them through through the volatility. And that's interesting, that word volatility, isn't it? Because that's just basically the measure of how um, how much a share price moves up and down. And Mm. volatility is much greater at this end of the market. Is that the case? 100%. One hundred percent. So, the the smaller end of the market is definitely more volatile, 
Where I push back on conventional thinking is that a lot of people associate volatility with risk. And to me, they're not the same thing. Volatility means, as you said, the share price is is whipsawing around. You see large moves up and down. But inherently, to me, risk is, is the fundamental analysis of the business. What is the risk that I could permanently lose my capital that, you know, this business could go under or the operations of the business, you know, are impacted in a way that is, is a permanent hit to the, the the earnings capacity of that business moving forward. And from that point of view, you know, as I said, they're slightly more risky just because we are talking about smaller businesses and smaller balance sheets, but not to the same extent that the volatility would imply. And that creates the opportunity where you've got businesses with volatile share prices that have hit, been hit quite hard, but the operations can still be quite solid, quite... Um, fundamentally strong and and come out the other side. And and yeah, that's the opportunity we look for as as small and micro cap investors. So that's something that I've been going on about for quite a while now, the difference between what normal people think risk is as opposed to what the finance industry defines as risk. And there's so many definitions of risk in the finance industry, Mm. but um, really for ordinary investors, it's just the idea. We just don't want to do all our dosh. That's right. That's right. And, and and so, you know, to go back to your question before about should people avoid the smaller end of the market, to me, the key is being able to build the conviction to, as you said, ride out that volatility and focus on the underlying definition of risk. You know, is there a permanent, a chance of a permanent loss of capital in this business? You know, you'll see people sometimes talk about unless you can dedicate large amounts of time, you know, hours a week, then you shouldn't delve into the micro and small cap end of the market. I push back on that. I mean, not sure whether we spoke about it last time I was on the podcast, but my entry into the um, investment career, I, I was doing this, you know, while I was working a, a full time career in another field and, and investing on the side, you know, in smaller micro cap stocks. A, a few hours of research a week, you know, maybe even less than that, it can still be enough to to understand, you know, without doing super deep dives into these companies. What do they do? How do they make money? And as you said, the key question is, what's the, the the risk that I could permanently do my money here? And there's some small things you can do to really minimize that risk. I mean, simply focusing on businesses that are profitable and pay a dividend, you will you will drastically reduce the risk of that happening. And there's there's dozens or hundreds of smaller micro cap companies that fit that definition, and and they're the ones I encourage people to to, to go out and find. Okay, so let's have a look at this table that um, we, we've been referring to. Basically, there seems to be uh, some columns there. We've got sub 20 million, 20 million to 100 million, 100 million to a billion, then a billion plus. Now, I'm assuming that's to do with the market capitalization of these particular companies in these sectors. Tell us about mm-hmm. this. Yeah, so look, this is a table I, I will give credit to to fellow micro cap investors, DMX Capital. Um, hopefully, we can link to their uh, monthly report in the show notes. And, and as you said, so it's a, it's a table that breaks up the market into four buckets by market capitalization: sub twenty mil, twenty mil to a hundred, hundred to a billion, and a billion plus. And then also by sector. But to me, the main thing I take out of this table is that market cap breakdown, and it's for financial year twenty twenty three returns. And you see very quickly that. The um, overall market did okay in FY23, entirely driven by the large caps, which of course are you know higher weighted. So when you see that overall index return, it's very much driven by those those large stocks at the at the top of the index. So for for companies in every sector over a billion dollars, the um, overall return was was eight percent. But as you come down that scale, one hundred million to a billion, negative two point nine. 20 million to 100 million, negative 16.7. And then, you know, what I would deem nano caps, where Merriweather Capital, we have, we have, you know, one or two holdings in this bucket, sub 20 mil market cap, um, negative 37.5. So you can see just that the linear progression of the smaller these businesses are, the less the market wanted to do with them over FY23 and, and, and simply just exited that end of the market to focus on larger, larger businesses, which again, as I said before, there's some rationality to that. They, uh, bigger businesses, bigger balance sheets, and, and there's a, a reason why you would expect them to be safer if you expected some some macroeconomic sort of uncertainty. But that sort of number to me screams almost panic selling and capitulation in, in certain pockets. And, and as a micro cap investor, it gets me a little bit excited about what the future could bring because, of course, you know that sets the platform for future returns. Is that what you refer to as the safety of liquidity? That's a term that you mentioned in the interview, and I was really interested mm-hmm. just to dig a little bit deeper into that. What's liquidity look like across this uh, table? 
So liquidity in general just means the you know amount of turnover that you have in a stock, you know, usually on a day is is how it's measured. And so when I say people seeking out the safety of liquidity, what that's really referring to is that when people are uncertain on the outlook for the market, for the economy, they want to be in stocks that they can quickly exit if that decision's made. So if their outlook turns quite sharply, be it on a piece of news or just coming to the view that they they want to reduce exposure to the market, you are able to exit those large liquid stocks much more easily. When you come down into the, the pockets of the market where I play, that's more difficult. Not a lot of dollar value actually changes hands in, in some of these stocks. It might only be a, a few thousand, ten thousand dollars a day. But then the other issue is there's often a large spread between the people who want to buy the stock and sell the stock. And, and that creates issues in and of itself. So you may want to, to sell a position, but if the you know the next buyer um, on the screen, you know, may be there at a, a 10% lower share price. That obviously creates issues that you, you can't actually exit the stock at the, at the price that it's it's currently displaying. So that's what I mean by about safety and liquidity. And that's a, that's a, a genuine phenomenon. Like that makes sense to me. It's rational to me. But again, it creates the opportunities for investors. And, and, and the key to this obviously is patience. Because again, you're talking about playing in a space where some of these businesses, if you were to enter them, you may not be able to get out anytime soon. So having the having the patience, having the long term thinking and perspective, um, I think there's there's some fantastic opportunities for investors um, who who have that and, and have the stomach to hold on to some of these positions for to the medium longer term. Is it worthwhile looking at um, the, the average daily trade of uh, certain of these listed companies just to see how much? buying or selling would actually affect the price of the stock? It's it's not something I have top of my list, um, again, because I, I like to focus on that long-term thinking. And, and if I like the fundamentals of a stock, then to me, liquidity becomes a, a secondary sort of consideration. But you have to be comfortable with your investing style and your and your capacity to be able to handle volatility. So for investors who you know may not be as seasoned as I am with with micro caps and small caps, definitely a consideration. You, you know you want to be able to find things where if I'm wrong, you know I can actually exit this stock quite easily. But for me, I like to focus more on the well. What if I'm right? You know, and there's fantastic opportunities where some of these subsectors um, in the table we we're just discussing. Discussing consumer discretionary stocks down fifty percent, healthcare down forty four, information technology, the poster child of, of you know the sell off down forty. So, I'm, I'm not rushing out to buy these stocks just because they've been sold off. You know, some of them deservedly so, but babies always get thrown out with the bathwater when you see those sorts of large swathes of selling. So, that's where I'm sort of fishing around at the minute for those opportunities. But again, with the knowledge that some of these I'll have to stomach some some more volatility and some of them I could just be wrong on you have to accept that as an investor um, you don't get every analysis correct but again from a micro cap point of view it doesn't take too many to go right to really um, overwhelm that risk reward on the other side so I've got this question and I think it's we need to change it slightly and that's has the hype left the small and micro cap end of the market but you, you kind of referred that this is based on rational decisions but when money does start flowing back into the market does it require a little bit of hype for people to become interested in this end again not necessarily hype it requires confidence so it requires confidence in in the market and the outlook and and, and people the confidence to be able to stomach less liquidity, more volatility, and, and um, you know, as I said before, businesses and balance sheets that aren't as safe and defensive as the larger caps. To answer your question as it's, it was originally posed, though, the hype has definitely come out of the market. But I've, I've been on the record saying a few times, that is a, a fantastic thing. Um, hype, hype is not good. Um, hype creates bubbles, bubbles burst, and, and leads to the situations that we're in today. So, you know, the, the poster child for me was was buy now, pay later through that sort of 2021 period, led by some, you know, some actual fundamentals made sense. You know, Afterpay was was doing quite well, but then you saw the hype around all of these minnows try to follow them. And I've said a few times that a market sell-off like what we've seen, it's like a forest fire. You need it every few years to remove that speculation and that hype. And businesses who don't have sustainable business models, who 
you know, we're basically never going to make it without the good grace of the market giving them capital. That's capitalism, that the capital flows to the pockets of the market where it's where it should go for the best return. So when I'm looking at the beaten down small and micro caps, what I would say to people is don't look at where share prices have been. 2021, it was hype, it was mania, and certain pockets of the market and certain businesses, they'll never get back to where they were. That that was a, a unique time. What you really need to be focused on, again, is coming back to the fundamentals of the business. For those businesses that can continue to grow, generate earnings, pay dividends, have, have you know good outlooks, particularly structural outlooks, I, I think I, I do agree on on being a bit more wary on the cyclical Australian economy. I'm not rushing to buy retailers or construction stocks or things like that. Businesses that can offer some more structural growth, though, I think look really interesting where they are. So to me, that's the key. It's not looking where they've been. It's finding the businesses that have, as I said before, babies are thrown out with the bathwater, but they're good businesses and they're going the right way. And um, when that confidence does return, they're the ones that will see that recovery come out the other side. What are a couple of the metrics that you focus on when you are valuing a business? Traditional metrics, of course, when, when they fit the the purpose. So, if you have businesses that are, are growing their earnings, you know, I, I can't go past just a classic price to earnings ratio, discounted cash flow. They are the ways you should value a business. ARR metrics and price to gross profit. A few things snuck in over the last couple of years, but but coming back to those old school metrics to me always makes sense. Where I think you need to be, I don't want to use the word creative because there's a negative connotation with that when we talk about accounting. Um, a, a, bit more, more a bit more qualitative. <laughs> exactly. To use we're the talking jargon. About, yeah. yeah. We're talking about businesses that are just earlier on in their life cycles and particularly their earnings life cycles. So you often come across businesses where operationally are doing really well, but management are making the very rational and often correct decision to reinvest back into their businesses. And that can create in the right circumstances, incredible rates of return into the future, but at the sacrifice of short-term profits. So, you know, if they wanted to appease the market, there's some stocks that could probably come out and report good earnings and trade on low PE multiples. But I actually have a lot of respect for management teams who are making, you know, what they believe are the right long-term decisions for their business and continue to invest. So you need to be a bit more willing to accept, okay, the multiple looks high, optically looks high, but what's happening behind that? You know, is there a a level of investment or is there a um, segment of the business that's currently loss making, but, you know, ha- has some promise? That's sort of how I tend to think about valuation, not so much what's the multiple here and now today, but it's, I've used this word a few times when I've done um, some media stuff. I like to think of the earnings engine being built. So, you know, what could earnings look like in in one, two, three years if, if, you know, things execute the way I hope they could and you start to see some scale emerge over, you know, the, the cost base. So it's more difficult. It's, it's a lot easier when you have businesses that are already mature, established, you know, well-defined earnings. But again, it's the opportunities that can be created because you're doing that little bit of extra work that that a, a normal price-to-earnings screen doesn't really show you. And the risk comes with that, obviously, where your analysis then has to be correct. And, and management have to execute. That's smaller micro-cap businesses. You're relying a lot on the execution of, of, of management and the business. Super is one of the most important investments you'll ever make. But how do you know if you're in the best fund for your situation? Head to lifesherpa.com.au to find out more. Life Sherpa, Australia's most affordable online financial advice. And it's by very nature, this these kind of businesses, that they've got to make pivots very quickly, don't they? Like they might um, suddenly identify another means of making revenue that they didn't even think of in the, in the first instance because opportunities present themselves. These are not mature businesses. These are kind of businesses that are looking for where the revenue is going to come for, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. And again, that creates a lot of opportunities for investors because we're in a market. It's very skittish and... I, I agree with you. I, I'm quite lenient with the management companies, not only that I invest in, but but broadly across the micro cap, small cap space. To your point, yes, you want these businesses to grow and experiment and tinker with their business models and their go to markets and their 
product bases and customers and pricing models and, and find the right product market fit. And then when you do, obviously drive hard into that. And I think we're in a market that's really not rewarding that at the minute. So businesses that may be trying to do a strategic shift or you know investing into a new product or new geography, you're not seeing much reward for that at all. Um, the market very much focused on what are the the metrics being reported today and not really looking at, well, what's this business investing for into the future? And again, it creates really good opportunities. We can talk about a couple um, you know, that I touched on in that Ausbiz interview, I think both fit into that bucket where the metrics today, they're not jumping off the page at you. But when you scratch below the surface and look at what these management teams are doing and the opportunities they're building and the, the optionality that they're providing um, within their businesses can actually be quite exciting. So I agree with your point, and, and and I I think you need to have that leniency that I was talking about. You, you need to be able to let management experiment and tinker um, and give them the time to try and make the strategic changes or shifts that will drive long-term value. It is the dream of any investor to have a company get in at the small end and watch it grow and suddenly become a large company. And of course, when it gets into the indices, uh, there's more attention, there's more funds that have to invest in it, and it can be a virtuous cycle. Can you run us through an example of a company that has grown big enough to make it into the ASX 300 and what the effects were on the company and how it's covered and what it meant for investors in that business? Oh, I can think of, of plenty of examples, but the, the, the one I'll... The one I'll um picked for the for the conversation is Altium Limited. You know, I first came across Altium back in 2010, 2011. And back then, you know, I was first introduced to the stock by a, um, a retail investor on a Facebook group. Um, you know, the market cap for the business was, I think, around $50 million. It's actually thinking about this now, it's a great example to circle back to the conversation we just had because back then Altium was actually going through its own strategic shift to build a platform for for their product and, and, a, and a, a cloud-based platform at that, which required some short-term investment and some muddy numbers and questions from the market about whether this was the right decision and could they compete with these established peers already in that space. And of course, we fast forward just over a decade and, and Altium is now a multi-billion dollar business sitting in the index. You know, It's gone from being on a um, a micro cap retail investor Facebook page to covered by probably a dozen broking houses and analysts and owned by numbers of of large fund managers. And and to me, that's, you know, again, it, it's a little bit of a cherry picked example, obviously. Not every of these stocks turn into Altium, but but there's there's plenty of them. Dicker Data, Objective Corp, ProMedicus. You can you can rattle off a list of names. They were all micro caps, small caps when they began their journeys. And the the key theme to all of them and this is why I always warn people against just looking back in hindsight because it's easy, really easy to look back in hindsight. But if you go back and you read some of the old reports from these businesses, they weren't super obvious. You know, Even back then, they weren't super obvious. They had their issues. They had their warts. They never looked perfect. But you know, like we said before, management grind away, they execute, they pull the right levers when they have to on strategic shifts, acquisitions. And then over time, good things happen and, and compounding takes effect and, and you end up with large, beautiful businesses that they're, they're the examples of what we want to find as, as small and micro cap investors. Okay. Well, let's have a look at the possibility of a couple of uh, businesses that we're keeping an eye on at the moment <laughs> without the uh, the benefit of foresight, of course. Yeah, of course. And, um, this is not a recommendation to buy anyone. This is just um, by way of an example and a way of looking at companies in this space. So tell us about Prophecy International. Yeah, Prophecy International, it's a software business, uh, two main pieces of software um, in sort of separate fields, but they share a commonality. So the first piece of software is called Emite. Um, it's analytic software for, for call centers. And the second piece of software is called Snare, which is a, a cyber security monitoring software. Um, so despite targeting very different end markets, um, as you can imagine, the key commonality is both of those pieces of software, their core reason for being is to ingest copious amounts of data, streamline that, filter that, and, and provide it in presentable and actionable ways to management. So, you know, you can imagine if you're in a call center, you've got thousands, if not 
millions of pieces of data being created every hour, every day, um, and being able to track that, monitor that, improve efficiency and performance. And cybersecurity is exactly the same. The, the heightened um, awareness around cybersecurity now, um, products like Snare are really coming to the forefront as a tool to monitor when you do have those sorts of incursions, like we saw with Optus and Medibank, something like a snare is the it, it, it monitors everything and, and so the way um, prophecy um, sort of markets the product is it answers three key questions did someone get in how did they get in and if they did what did they see take or change um, and it's that sort of monitoring software so again you, you're taking in copious amounts of data from all sorts of endpoints trying to determine those things to come to the business and the financials the reason why I think it's interesting and and you know I'll, I'll, I'll play a comparison to that Altium example just before, the business has been through a large transition over the last few years. The first part of that was, like a lot of software businesses, making that transition to cloud-based software as a service. They used to be on-premise, legacy integrations with, with complex legacy infrastructure. Now it's all cloud deployed in minutes you know, into cloud-based infrastructure. And it's such a it's such a better business model. It's such a, you know, fantastic business model. There's a reason why the market has, has realized that the beauty of the software as a service business model, the recurring revenue that comes alongside it. Um, so they've been doing that over the last few years, sort of, you know, they've finished it with Emite. They're, you know, halfway through or maybe a bit earlier with Snare. And that creates, I think, the opportunity you're seeing in the market. It's about a 40 mil market cap at the minute, 40, 45, uh, but 13 mil cash in the bank, cash flow break even. So to me, like when we go back to what we were talking about before. Sorry, look, liked, I, was that 13 or 30 mil? Cash in the 13, bank. 13, 13. Yeah. Still not bad for that size, sort of capitalization, though, is it? No. So, so it's a, you know, a rock solid balance sheet and, and, and cash flow break even. So they're not eating into that cash balance either. Um, it, it's sort of a nice buffer for them. To go back to what I was sort of saying before about my investing style, and, and, I, and I think the right style to have for smaller micro caps is to focus on that downside first. You know, am I protected by a, a good balance sheet, good operations, good cash flow? Prophecy ticks all those boxes for me. And so the way I look at it as a business, 22 mil annualized recurring revenue, it's through that sort of break-even profitability inflection point. Good software businesses, like I think Prophecy is, you really start to see these businesses scale um, once you get to that sort of 20, 25, 30 mil recurring revenue. And so, as I said before, I think about the earnings engine being built. And, and I think Prophecy's got a very nice earnings engine where if they can just grow modestly over the next few years, maybe 15 to 20% a year, which is you know reasonable for a software business in, in some nice, you know, structurally growing addressable markets, you you would see good chunks of that incremental revenue fall down to the, the profit line. And I've sort of got prophecy, maybe FY24, FY25, two to three mil net profits around that sort of 45 mil market cap. So, you know, 15 times-ish earnings without some aggressive assumptions looking forward a year or two. And that's, you know, it's a good example of how I like to, th like we said before, how I like to think about valuation for these small businesses, because there's there's no PE multiple you can point to right now and say prophecy trades on X PE. You need to sort of have that view of, okay, what do things look like in a year or two, you know, and, and uh, don't be too aggressive, obviously. <laughs> don't assume, don't assume the world, uh, you know, takes over, takes over the world, but some, some, Conservative assumptions, and I think you get to some very reasonable valuations quite quickly, and that the certainty of the cash balance and and the cash flow break even is 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 the other part of it as well. What's the ticker code for it as well? P R O. Yeah, so Prophecy International. We'll get back to the show right after this brief message. Why am I buying, holding, or selling a share? If you can't answer that basic question, then you don't have a plan. The best investors are ruthless in executing their plans. I've been fortunate to meet many great investors on the podcast. Tony Kynaston is one of the best. He has a clear and systematic approach to investing that is honest, sensible, and methodical. It's called QAV, quality at value. QAV now offer an excellent light plan for only $29 per month. You can follow their buy and sell recommendations and learn the ropes. And the first month is free using the promo code SFBLIGHT. Go to qavpodcast.com.au to sign up. That's qavpodcast.com.au using the promo code SFBLIGHT. Past performance is not a guarantee of future returns. Please read the QAV FSG and consult a financial professional before investing. I receive a small commission for services I recommend and I only recommend services I use myself. Okay, then Global Health, that's the next company you wanted to talk about. 
Yeah, global health. So, so Property International, to go back to that table we were talking about, sits in that 20 to 100 mil, which had, had been hit hard and Prophecy had as well. You know, the share price is, is down quite substantially from its 2021 peak. But global health is in that sub 20 mil market cap. So, that nano cap range where as I said, on average, these stocks are down 37%. Um, and global health is is one of those down quite substantially. So it's about a seven mil market cap. So what these guys do, it's patient administration software and electronic medical record software for um allied health, private hospitals, and um, you know, some some ad hoc sort of specialists as well. But a very established revenue base. Again, where I sort of get excited about this business looking forward is the reported numbers sort of mask the the underlying growth of the business over the last few years. Um, so they earn revenue in two ways. One is the recurring revenue they get from their software. And the other is they charge companies implementation fees for you know installing their software, maintaining it, upgrading it, things like that. Now, Global Health is a little bit different to Prophecy in that in the medical space where they play, you still deal with on-premise legacy softwares. Um, me, you know, medicine is, is is an area that it has not kept up with the rest of the world and the pivot to the cloud and and always being um, in, in the cloud-hosted uh, infrastructure. So they generate quite healthy sort of professional services fees for going on site, helping their customers integrate, upgrade and maintain. But that actually fell off through COVID, as you'd imagine. You know, hospitals and and um, allied health and, and specialists had a lot of other things to focus on and, and deployment of software fell down the list. And so when you looked at the numbers for global health, their, their headline revenue and profit numbers you know, looked quite ugly through that period. But the underlying software business has grown quite steadily, you know, about 15 to 20% a year for the last three or four years. And that's where I start to get a bit of optimism about the future. I, I continue, They've won some good contracts, so you get some visibility of what that could look like in the future. And I think you see that sort of same steady compound growth on the software level and the return of the professional implementation. They've called out that they've seen a recovery this year. Um, they're able to, to, to get on site again, sit down with their customers and, and you know, start to to implement some of these contracts they've won over the last couple of years. And of course, implementation then leads to that recurring software. So it's a, it's a very good leading indicator. So at a seven mil market cap, and they've got about seven mil in recurring revenue, so about one times ARR, um, where the market I think is is pessimistic on the business, and, and rightfully so to a degree, is they are still going through what they call um, the replatforming of their software, which is basically taking their um, on-premise software into the cloud for, for certain customers who are ready for that. And that's that's expensive. We were talking about Prophecy before. Prophecy went through that same process uh, earlier, back in 2018, 2019, they started the process. But it is expensive to upgrade your software from, from on-premise to cloud, but a necessary one. They, they have to do it. And, and again, it it's circles the conversation back nicely to what we were talking about, having some leniency for these management teams who are strategically making the right decision. I, I have no doubt that long-term, taking their core master care product from on-premise to the cloud is the right decision for global health, um, but you are not being rewarded by the market right now because it's costing them roughly you know, three to $400,000 a quarter in development costs. So I think that should wind off though. They've sort of flagged that over the next six months, the the bulk of that will finish. I think you have the professional service revenues and and the ongoing compound of, of the software revenues. It, to me, provides a very interesting position for where the business is right now. It's it's undoubtedly cheap. On again, not the biggest fan of ARR metrics, but you know, one times um, recurring revenue is is you know undoubtedly cheap on that metric. And it's the optionality you have for if the business can execute. But one and just one of the other things. I like about this business and I like to see in smaller micro caps is they often punch above their weight. And so in an unheralded announcement a few weeks ago, Global Health um, announced that their software was um, selected by a subsidiary of Woolworths called A Healthy Life to provide the, the the backbone to their telehealth services that they wanted to pivot into. And it's always interesting to me, you know, obviously for for Global Health, that's great as a as a shareholder in the business. But there's a there's a lot of smaller micro caps around, and, and you find them, and they're doing some really interesting things. And as I said, punching above their weights and beating out some larger peers. Luke Winchester. It's been great chatting with you again today. Thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future.